Good afternoon, everyone. Is the mic on? Good afternoon and welcome. Hi, you're back. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome. It's so nice to see everyone greeting each other. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 66th Annual Meeting of the Literacy Research Association. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Becky Rogers, and again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 66th Annual Meeting of the Literacy Research Association. I know that as we gather here today, many of us have heavy hearts for the victims of the continued environmental catastrophes. Just a few hours from here, there are wildfires devastating Gatlingburg. I want to thank Danielle Dennis. I don't know if she's in the room, but she sent out information to the LRA listserv about how you can contribute to the healing and reconstruction efforts that are, that are underway. Our hearts are also heavy because of the continued and aggravated violence against minoritized children, youth, and families. Yet there's also a spirit of cautious optimism, of what Patricia Hill Collins refers to as visionary pragmatism. We're gathered here, people have come from near and they've come from far because we believe in the potential to use literacy scholarship to create equitable classrooms, schools, and communities. So I thank you for being here in Nashville. I'm going to introduce you to today's plenary session, which includes the Albert J. Kingston Award presentation, the Student Outstanding Research Award presentation, the recognition of Star Fellows, and then we'll proceed with the 2016 presidential address presented by Patricio and CISO. Before we begin, I have a few brief announcements. First, following the plenary, uh, the presidential address, you're all invited to attend the presidential reception, which will be right out in the foyer. Um, we'll have some good food, we'll have a cash bar. We'll also have the legendary jazz musician, Thomas Kane, who will be playing. So I think that that will be um, really nice. Please join us for that. Um, we, um, and this is an opportunity to thank and honor Pat and CISO for her service to LRA. Please join me now in a round of applause for that. Um, if you have not yet, um, stop by the registration area to participate in the LRA book display and silent auction. We also want to thank our exhibitors this week, TCP and Guilford. We appreciate their continued support of LRA. Your silent auction bid number is on the back of your badge if you haven't found that yet. Um, also, I hope that everyone is getting familiar with the app. Um, it's, um, there's lots of information in there. We've um, tried to recreate the program in a digital format, so it's, it's interactive. If you're having trouble, reach out to a colleague who can help you with that. Um, the registration, our, um, uh, staff Association, KWMG, is uh, happy to assist you as well. Later tonight, from 9 until midnight, we invite you to attend Vital Issues in Bar, line, bar Lines, hosted by the LRA Field Council. Thank you to the Field Council for all of your amazing work. Um, really, the conference is a collective effort, and I have so many people to thank. Um, I want to thank the area chairs. Thank you for creating amazing sessions. Um, I also want to thank the executive committee and the board, um, particularly Gay Ivey, who is co-chair and vice president, um, and the KWMG staff for all of your assistance. 
So now I turn to Jill Kastik, who is the chair of the Albert J. Kingston Award Committee. Jill? Hello, everyone. I'm Jill Kastik from the University of Arizona, and I'm the chair of the Albert J. Kingston Award Committee. The Albert J. Kingston Service Award is given to honor an LRA member for exemplary contributions of service to the organization. It has been my distinct pleasure over the last six years that I've served on this committee to reflect on the collective impact of all of the nominees' service to LRA and the way those service contributions have helped shape this organization. Service is a vitally important part of keeping LRA a great professional organization. I'd like to recognize the service contributions of all the nominees for this award this year. Your distinguished service to LRA is inspiring to the entire membership. In deliberating the award, the Kingston committee members carefully examined all the nominees' materials and reflected on the nominees' substantial and significant contributions of service to LRA, including the breadth of service, the depth of service, and the length of service. I'd like to thank the 2016 Kingston committee members for their dedication in reviewing and deliberating this year's large nomination pool. Please stand up as I call your name. Cynthia Greenleaf, Millie Gort, Melody Zock, Mark Vagel, Haney Yoon, and Bernadette Dwyer. And now I'll hand it over to Kathy Hinchman, the 2015 Albert J. Kingston Award winner, who will introduce this year's award recipient. Hi, everyone. I just want to make sure this is not the winner of the Al Kingston Award. <laughs> this is actually Al Kingston. All right. If you're um, new to the organization, you know that I'm supposed to gradually reveal clues so that you can guess who the winner is. We'll see how I did on this. The big concern is the Kingston Award winner is roughly my age, and so to transport pictures into PowerPoint slides that were taken in the aughts is no, just <laughs> is no mean feat. Okay, early years. Here's our winner, recognizable by what one colleague described as a look of healthy skepticism. That's why I have like green blobs over her face all the time, because you would recognize even her baby picture. Right? Here our winner also displays an early penchant for service, taking care of her little brother and the family dog. Our winner is a woman who is said by her family to be bossy though that'll be hard for you to believe once you know our winner's identity. Um, you can see now we've had the gender reveal, right? <laughs> we've also had like a skin color reveal. We can tell another thing about this person, right? Um, it'll give you another clue to know she attended a segregated K-8 school and then moved to a mostly high school where they also figured out she was a really good community servant. One of those pictures is a newspaper clipping and it's our winner as a senior class officer. Um, a piano player, our winner says, it took college at North Carolina A&T to figure out that she was a better pianist in her hometown than she was when she got to college. From a town where many people, um, white and black, shared the same Irish last name as hers, Family is at the heart of everything for this longtime LRA member, where scholarship has always been juggled with love and life, including raising two boys on a GA ship. She notes that she loves to cook and bake. I'll let you appreciate the family for a minute. Another clue, these are friends of our winners from first grade, and she's still in contact with them pretty regularly. Another clue is that this woman is loyal. She's a person who holds on to her friends, and I can attest to that from personal experience. 
Now you can see that the green PowerPoint template provides another clue to our Kingston winner's identity. This music teacher attended graduate school with many of our service-oriented Spartan colleagues, some of whom are collaborators of this winner even today. This winner has been true to the Spartan service tradition, helping with decades of LRA conference programs, yearbooks, Journal of Literacy Research Reviews, and committees like the P. David Pearson Award, the Multicultural, Critical Spaces, International Long Range Planning, and Early Career Achievement, in addition to her years on the Literacy Research Association Board of Directors. Our winner also does considerable service in her community in her longtime place of employment, where she has been on many committees, served as the TIA coordinator and associate dean for academic affairs, as well as, or teacher education, I'm the associate dean for academic affairs, sorry, it just slipped out of my tongue. <laughs> you can tell what I dream about at night. <laughs> as well as mentor to LRA members Bogum Yoon Chinwe Ipkezi, Tiffany Nayache. So she's mentored many doctoral students along the way. According to her nominator, this Kingston winner is an outstanding scholar who understands the value of service to LRA and has made time to make appreciable contributions to the organization, as well as to all other aspects of the profession. Without a doubt, she is very deserving of the Albert J. Kingston Award. Please join me in congratulating our winner, Dr. Fenice Boyd from the University of Buffalo. First, I want to thank the Apple J. Kingston Award Committee, Jill Castic, the chair, and my nominators. I greatly appreciate your dedication, commitment, and time that you spend serving on this committee as well as LRA. Also, a special thank you to my colleague and friend, Kathy Henchman, for that awesome introduction. It was fun. And thanks to all of my LRA colleagues and mentors. Thanks to my colleagues and students at the University at Buffalo, as well as my mentors and peers at Michigan State University, both past and present. You all continue to inspire me in so many different ways. To my sons, Averick and Jamal, thank you for putting up with me, especially when you were with me those late nights in MSU Library, as well as my office at UGA, when you should have been in bed. Your good nature and patience, patience has allowed me to pursue numerous great opportunities, and I want you to know how much I love you and appreciate you. I'd also like to thank my mother, Patty Boyd, and, uh, and my godmother, who is also my first grade teacher, Clarice Green, who taught me how to read and write. Other than knowing that I'm a professor at UB, they really don't understand what I do for a living but support me nevertheless. I am honored to be a member of LRA and believe that I've benefited a great deal over the years. I look forward to con continuing to serve the organization to the best of my ability. I am extremely humbled to receive this award, so thank you. Congratulations, Phineas, and thank you to Jill and to Kathy Hinchman. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Doris Walker Dahlhouse, who is the chair of the Student Outstanding Research Award Committee. Doris. Thank you, Becky. The annual LRA Student Outstanding Research Award was initiated in 1985 to encourage greater participation of students in LRA meetings and to honor excellent scholarship efforts. 
The award is given for an outstanding student conference paper, which may or may not be based on a dissertation. A version of the winning paper is published in the yearbook. The paper must be based on the proposal submitted to the annual conference program, while the author held student status and based on research conducted by the student. The paper must be written solely by the student or co-authored with students and cannot be co-authored or co-presented with a faculty member. The proposal must have been accepted by the annual conference committee for presentation at the annual conference. Papers representing various forms and genres of research, including conceptual papers, will be welcomed. Before I announce the winner of the 2016 uh, Out Student Outstanding Research Award, I must thank the wonderful group of people who spread the word about the award, read proposals multiple times, and continue to work with me as we share information on next year's award with students who are thinking about applying for it. I would love for members of the SRA committee to stand, and they are, Amanda Goodwin, Juliet Halliday, Chris Idings, Julie Justice, Alice Lee, Minda Lopez, Laura May, Soyam Meacham, Monica Garden Hershey, Renita Schmidt, and Tanya Wright. Now for the great reveal. This year's winner is Dan Reynolds. Dan is a doctoral candidate at Vanderbilt. Dan's doctoral advisor is Dr. Amanda Goodwin. His winning paper is entitled Interactional Scaffolding for Reading Comprehension, a Systematic Review. I want to congratulate Dan on such a wonderful paper and to let him know that we look forward to his future contributions to the field of literacy. Dan, would you come forward and accept your award? Thank you very much, Dr. Walker Dalhouse, and I want to say thanks to the whole Student Outstanding Research Award Committee and all of LRA for taking the time, effort to recognize the hard work of doc students all around the U.S. and all around the world. Uh, it feels great to be part of an organization that recognizes doc students as legitimate participants. Um, secondly, I want to say thanks to my family, uh, my wonderful wife, Laura, and my three kids, Mary, Bridget, and Jack. Jack, at uh, seven weeks old back there, might be the youngest person in the audience. Um, but they've supported me through the challenges of all of doctoral study. It's so great to come home to them, and it's just been amazing having them by my side while I try to figure out what, uh, what doctoral study and what education research is really about. I also want to say thanks to the amazing community at Vanderbilt, um, like those professors I've worked with in class, like Kevin Leander and Lonnie Horn, Emily Pendergrass, Bob Jimenez. A lot of those professors are where some of my ideas first took shape. I want to say a special thanks to my doctoral committee. Um, some advice to any of you earlier doc students, pick a doctoral committee that's going to really push your work and challenge you in a lot of ways. It's going to make you so much better. So a special thanks to Debbie Rowe and Rogers Hall and Freddie Hebert. Uh, who have done great work in that way. Um, a big thanks to my advisor, Amanda Goodwin, who is about the best advisor anybody could ask for, who tirelessly answers my emails at all hours. She reviews so many, uh, much of my writing, has helped shape so many of my ideas, has encouraged me in everything, just about the best advisor anybody could ask for. 
So just a final thanks to uh, some people who will never hear this, um, who may not even know that I'm talking right now. Um, my former students in my English classes at Redemptorist High School in Baton Rouge and San Juan Diego Catholic High School in Austin, uh, they're the ones who taught me about scaffolding and literacy and reading. Uh, they're the ones that I learned from. And as all of us uh, know, the work goes ever on, but uh, they're the ones that we should always remember when we think about these things. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Doris, and congratulations, Dan. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Cynthia Lewis, who will introduce our president. Hi, everybody. I'm Cynthia Lewis from the University of Minnesota. It's such an honor to have the oppor this opportunity to introduce our LRA president and my dear friend, Pat Nciso. Pat, as many of you know, is Professor of Literacy, of Literacy for Children and Young Adults in the Department of Teaching and Learning at The Ohio State University, as well as affiliated faculty in Latino Studies. I'll start by confessing that I'm a little put out by Pat being president, because this has meant that her amazing family is here to cheer her on which, in turn, means that I don't get to have my BFF as my roommate. <laughs> you all know the contributions Pat has made to our field and to our organization, but you might not know how much fun she is, nor how dedicated she is to her topic today of mobilizing imagination. <laughs> the photo on the screen might give you some sense of both. You can see here that she will go to great lengths to try to mobilize her own imagination, including donning this unusual headgear thinking cap thing that was connected to an exhibit in a museum in Sydney, Australia, where we had a great time together for a week-long conference. I first met Pat over 20 years ago at LRA, of all places, in 1995 when we saw each other's name tags and exclaimed our interest in each other's work and soon became fast friends. By that time, Pat had already written her early forays into reader stance and engagement in literary reading. She had already written several articles on cultural identity as not, on, as not only connected to, but at the very core of literary interpretation. She later built on this work in her landmark, in one of many landmark studies of a diverse group of children responding to the book Maniac McGee. In this work, and in much of her work since, Pat has paid close attention not only to the resourceful and imaginative work of children, the mediation of teachers, and the complexity of culturally rich contexts, but she also examines the text's ideology from a critical framework. In doing so, she asks all of us to understand that who the text addresses and what kinds of readings it is meant to produce matters a great deal, especially when we think about how the imagination itself, as well as the text, can be colonized. In addition to all of this work, Pat has been instrumental in underscoring the importance of children's literature, as in her co-edited Handbook of Research on Children and Young Adult Literature, and in her advocacy of Latinx children's literature that has been so terribly underrepresented in the market and in our schools. Throughout her career, Pat has worked with children as they have created story worlds. This work has helped us all to understand the power of narrative, drama, and other art forms as responses to text and media that can reach beyond discussion to promote a critical cosmopolitanism that involves social transfer Formation in the imaginative interactions across differences. Pat's research has led a whole generation of literacy researchers to rethink what we mean by literacy and reading, what counts, whose histories are valued, how we define what it means to be a good reader, and what kind of possible futures are available to our young readers, especially those who have been marginalized through educational and other forms of injustice. In these very bleak times, with Islamophobia, xenophobia, and racism at the center of our national psyche and daily imposed on black and brown bodies, Pat and Cizo's work is ever more important. 
I believe that the children and story worlds she will share with us today will give us hope for a more socially just future. Please join me in a round of applause for our LRA president, Pat Nciso. Thank you, Cynthia, for such a beautiful introduction. To be recognized through the eyes of a great friend is a gift beyond measure. And to be here addressing colleagues and friends whose work and lives have shaped mine is humbling indeed. I am deeply grateful for your faith in me and for your continuing commitment to this great organization. From the new imminent scholars, to eminent scholars, I can only express my deep gratitude for all you've given and all you continue to give, including Rob Tierney, my advisor, who set me on this path of literacy research. It's all your fault. <laughs> thank you. I also want to thank my family for being here in the center pew here. <laughs> um, Brian for being my great colleague and for listening and listening and listening. Michael and Zoe, I'm so proud of you. And I wanna thank my sisters, Gail, Angie, Katie, Judy, and Nancy, <laughs> um, and my brother, Joe. Thank you, and my brother, Tom. <laughs> Thanks for traveling all the way here today. And to our parents, Marianne and Fran and Ciso, I love you all. Let the circle be unbroken. We have all kinds of cheers in our family, but I'll just, uh, we're just gonna do that one. <laughs> to our Ohio State community of graduate students and faculty, I am so proud to be part of this great tradition of drama, literature, and literacy scholarship. And I am deeply grateful to all of you who have sent messages of both sorrow and support around the recent tragedies at Ohio State. Finally, I've had the privilege to serve as president with an extraordinary executive team over the past few years. Janice, Arlette, Gay, Becky, Marcel, Patrian, Gwen, and Lynn. I continue to learn from your leadership and vision. I'm especially grateful to Becky Rogers I know how hard it is to put this program together. <laughs> and Becky, you've done an incredible job of envisioning and planning a conference based in community and justice. Thank you. <laughs> this year, more than ever, as we've heard from previous speakers, we have gathered at the annual conference in anticipation of renewing friendships among our colleagues we know and trust, just as young people and children seek reassurance that all will be well in the face of change. And yet all is not well, and has not been well for decades. Youth are angry and scared, and many do not know where to turn for justice or solace. Schooling has been and is becoming a source of pain and even shock as youth are bullied, or worse, harmed and killed by adults who are emboldened by a resurgence in nationalist rhetoric and violence. And now here we are in this present moment in Nashville, glad to be together, and still we look around and wonder what has not been said what can we say? Who can we trust? And what can we never understand about one another's perspectives and lives? What can we do? As Juno Diaz writes, we can aim for radical hope. Diaz explains that radical hope is something you practice. It is directed toward a future goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what it is. It demands flexibility, openness, and imaginative excellence. 
We need to be engaged in radical hope out loud. I base this talk on the claim that we can and must practice radical hope and imagination within the politics of speaking and being heard. As Gyatri Spivak writes, the speaking may be the easy part. The question is who will listen? My ideas about imagination are informed by novelists, philosophers, and cultural anthropologists, as well as black and Latinx feminist theorists who understand imagination as action across spaces through intersecting histories and standpoints. I do not focus on these philosophies today, but rather consider critical, sociocultural, and narrative theories that offer insight into the mechanisms of imagination that can be mobilized in our research and teaching, in our communities, and in our organization, in the context of so much loss and uncertainty. I want to begin with the value of diverse literature in disrupting the everyday. Throughout my career as an educator and researcher, I have listened to children and adults talk about and animate stories that often resonate deeply with their everyday lives or call upon them to question their perspectives as they gain insight into the humanity and histories of others' experiences. Stories like The Circuit, Gabby, A Girl in Pieces, Out of Darkness, American Born Chinese, Ms. Marvel, No Normal, and Last Stop on Market Street place the voices and relationships of Latinx African American, Asian, South Asian, Native First Nation, LGBT, and new immigrant people at the center of the narrative, giving depth and value to particular historically nuanced ways of seeing the world. These stories and images are transformative for non-dominant young readers and adults who see themselves represented in books in positive, engaging, and dynam dynamic ways, and likewise, for youth and adults who break through the confines of an all-white colonized world and begin to adjust their social locations from the center to a tentative collective. We need thousands more stories like those I listed. Currently, less than 10% of the more than 3,000 books published annually represent this diversity. And this percentage is no better in school reading materials. We want youth and adults to imagine with more stories, with more accurate and insightful images and storylines. Because such stories disrupt the everyday. They break open what is habitual, habitual and normalized and propel us into past and future landscapes, into the subjunctive mode. What if? What might be? These breaks and disruptions are also the beginning points for understanding imagination as social practice. So now I'm going to talk about theory. All of you are going to be very excited about that. <laughs> Sociocultural theory focuses on what is possible, what might be transformed and redefined for new situations. We use culturally historically formed symbols of many, many modes to see beyond what is given, to anticipate and rework what is in front of us so we can plan a future and change the present. Maxine Green calls this our capacity to imagine the world otherwise. Chris Gutierrez calls this kind of reach and remaking of the everyday social dreaming. She describes a group of young adults, all migrant and Mexican American, who spent several weeks on a major campus studying their intellectual heritage and the possibilities for shaping and contributing to a more expansive vision of education. Near the last days of their studies, the adult facilitators of the program took the youth on a walk across campus, stopping at different buildings and dramatizing the young people's words and discussions through embodied images of dreamers, lifting and reaching without boundaries in the midst of a space that did not historically welcome or expect them. Through drama and metaphor, a space was made and sustained that invited youth to re-envision their past and see themselves in the present through the eyes of their future selves, dreaming and contributing on their terms. 
The practice of imagination is especially evident when everyday relations and places are remade and renamed to deliberately call attention to new voices and possibilities as they were in the example of the social dreaming. But imagination is also mundane. According to Vygotsky, Vygotsky's theory of learning and development, imagination is a constant in all cultural life. He says, all that is the work of the human hand, the whole world of culture, is a product of human imagination. Vygotsky was interested in how we shape and are shaped by culturally formed materials. He understood a process of mediation that happens across time, sometimes in fleeting moments, but also over expend, ex, sorry, extended time frames. So let me give a current example of the ways we transform material through action and social relationships within movement across time. We all got an email about the new guidebook book app, which is replacing a hard copy of the conference program, which my husband reacted to in horror. <laughs> I explained how imagination works and he was fine. So we, <laughs> we have this, he actually has a paper copy. So <laughs> There's a Wayback Machine. So we have this disruption from the usual and uncertainty. How is this going to work? Well, as Becky said in her welcome message, we'll be working through the apprenticeship model. So you were in this present moment, downloading guidebook, referencing all the other experiences you've had uh, with uh, sorry, all the other experiences you've had with apps and downloads and conferences in the program format while projecting forward to finding your room and your time in the schedule. You might anticipate frustration or relief that we are finally in the 21st century. In a moment though, you need to act and off you go to your session. Some of you might continue to work on your past, present, future integration systems but I encourage you to just keep clicking or use the search icon. That's everyday imagination at work. We notice a change or ambiguity in the present. We reference past experience and materials and emotions and project likely, you know, I'm hearing, do you all hear an echo? No? Okay, it's just me, never mind. Okay. <laughs> we notice a change or amb ambiguity in the present. We reference past experience and materials and emotions and project likely scenarios and needs in the future, then act in the present to resolve the uncertainty. This happens seamlessly in most cases, usually with the help of people we know and trust. Such experiences are common and keep life interesting. But this scenario assumes equality of histories and relationships which are rarely the case in academia or academic ref conferences. In terms of imagination, inequality presents disruptions and uncertainty about future relations, but also presents a gap in time for assessing and potentially transforming how past experiences and potential futures might be understood and shaped. In the example of social dreaming, the gap in time was extended, allowing a suspension of usual relationships between people and places so that new voices could enter and present possible futures. In more fleeting moments, we adjust, translate, recalibrate trust, gauge what can and cannot be spoken, and what will and will not be heard whether imbued with a sense of possibility or with caution and constraint, disruptions create openings, gaps in time and space for improvisation and the assertion of possible ways of being and seeing oneself and others in the world. Let me summarize with a working definition. Imagination entails the effort to manage gaps in time between what is, what has been, and what might become within contexts of unequal histories and expectations for speaking and being heard. With this definition in mind, I want to illustrate and extend these ideas about uncertainty, inequality, and possible futures through three stories. The first story is from my family history, and then the second and third are stories from my research 
with a multi-ethnic, multiracial, and multilingual group of middle school students as they took the risk of imagining otherwise. The story from my family's history takes me into a past that has echoes in the present. I tell this story to understand how we may be haunted by lost stories, how those pasts are never gone. My grandmother, Clara Tecla Christian, was born in New Orleans and grew up in Laredo, Texas. Her family had immigrated to Louisiana from the Alsace, and so she was part of a multilingual family speaking French, German, Spanish, and English. She met my grandfather in Laredo, Texas, Antonio Enciso, a Mexican national from Zacatecas. They married in 1920 and then moved to Toledo, Ohio. When they were married, the 1907 Expatriation Act was still legal. Expatriation Act. The act followed other laws at the time, designating women as the property of their husbands and subject to his citizenship rights. By law, when she married Antonio and Ciso, Clara Christian's US citizenship was revoked and replaced with Mexican citizenship. We cannot figure out how the Mexican government got involved in this, and if they certified, they probably didn't. It's kind of all made up, right? The paper trail. In 1930, after winning a series of legal battles for equal rights, most women who were expatriated were able to file for their US citizenship, even if their husbands were not citizens. My grandmother declared her requ request for naturalization in 1930 and swore her refusal of allegiance to the United States of Mexico. Her renaturalization papers indicate her race as American. This is racialization at work through nationalism. This was also a time of intense anti-Mexican racism fueled by the Mexican repatriation program that authorized brutal policing and forced deportation of more than two million Mexican Americans. 60% were US citizens. Like millions of families today, my grandparents had to make choices under the threat of division and isolation and in the face of unrelenting poverty. They had to participate in the procedures that would offer a future based on survival with the hopes of eventually being recognized as fully human. Less than a month ago, the US president-elect announced a plan to deport three million people, calling them criminals. This is a signal to gear up the machinery and economies of deportation, to build detention centers, prisons, transportation infrastructure, and to authorize fast-track legal proceedings so that the declared number, three million, will seem like an accomplishment, not a repeated violation of human and civil rights. These refusals of rights and identities are also refusals of histories. Rights and identities are lost in the present through a projected future that relies on erasures and racism for millions of people, the space and time to imagine a future is on hold. Another family story, also set in 1930, during the repatriation program, took place when my father, Francis Enciso, was about five years old. A census taker recorded the data about my family's nationalities and the languages spoken in their home. In response to the question, English speaking, yes was recorded and then scratched out. To be English and Spanish bilingual was unimaginable. The census taker anticipated languages to be partitioned. So what might have been a productive gap for questioning became an erasure. Therefore, my father and his siblings, like hundreds of thousands of children of his era and continuing to this day, were deemed deficient in both languages. The space between English and Spanish and the history that brought them together were not comprehended, not imagined, and were therefore erased. During that year, the adults in his family decided to stop speaking Spanish with my dad so he would be able to attend the Catholic English dominant school rather than be relegated to the poorly funded Spanish speaking school 
designate, designated for Mexican children in Toledo, Ohio. All that remained of Spanish while we were growing up were the clear inflections of Mexican Spanish when my dad recited the alphabet or numbers or shouted, dame un beso, to unsuspecting telemarketers. <laughs> a few months before he died, in a moment of reflection and vulnerability, my dad told me that he wished he had been able to speak Spanish. Spanish held lost stories and possible futures, animated by the particular sounds and memories of unfolding life among family and friends. These losses, these erasures of the past and closures of possible futures reverberate across generations. I did not know this history until I was an adult. No book or family conversation helped me see the meaning of being third generation Mexican American in Ohio. I had no frame of reference to understand Mexican and US relations from school or home, and neither did my dad. And now I stand between this history and the construction of a racial identity as a white woman with lost histories. I have not had to confront racism or linguicism on a daily basis. Therefore, I can easily be blind to the ways academia and schooling exclude and harm youth and adults who experience racism. But learning this history and staying close to the continuing losses and struggles of Latino people means that I, I can be more deliberate about creating spaces for speaking and being heard, for stories to be told. Stories and their legacies disrupt the future. Professor Chris Lebron, a scholar of African American studies and philosophy, explained in a recent New York Times essay how the present and future are distorted by silences in the past. He references James Baldwin, who believed that, quote, in refusing to deal honestly with the fact that their prosperity depends entirely on a history of black exploitation, rape, murder, and pillage, whites imbue their identity with an innocence that allows them to see the future as open and free and their minutes and days as pregnant with possibility and power. What happens in these instances is indeed a warping of time. The laws of the universe are experienced without friction for white Americans because a willful denial of the past leaves them with no sense that their present is insecure or that their future is in question. It will always be okay in exactly one minute, day, or year from now. But this is not many blacks' experience of time, nor Latinx, LGBT, indigenous, new immigrant, or poor, or people with disabilities, or people whose religions are maligned, and those who are poor and white. All are subject to cycles of erasures that excuse violence against us in the past and project marginalization, silencing, ex and expendable lives into the future. We teach, we research, we strive to make literacy worthwhile and relevant, but we do this with flawed understanding of one another's pasts and with insufficient reach toward an equi equitable or just future. I want to do more in the present, and I believe all of us in this room are also seeking frameworks and direction for a change, for futures without fear. But change and uncertainty can be overwhelming. Gaps and openings to possible futures are easily shut down. As Lisa Delpa pointed out almost 30 years ago in her analysis of the silence dialogue among black and white middle-class teachers who brought very different cultural and social histories and different visions of children's futures to their teaching and therefore different actions in the present. These differences based in unspoken histories with, within white dominant spaces are difficult to resolve. They're also difficult for white educators to see even though they appear daily. 
institutionalize racial hierarchies then and now, create unequal power relations for speaking and being heard. From a discourse perspective, to speak or to have a voice involves using all linguistic and semiotic means to make oneself understood by others. And to be heard means making oneself understood in the presence of implicit and explicit codes, customs, rules, expectations, and so forth that authorize and rationalize who and what is included or excluded. This is a mighty effort to use all linguistic and semiotic resources to make oneself understood by others. An effort which falls disproportionately and with disproportionate harm on marginalized youth, educators, and researchers. So, how might gaps be sustained when different histories are invoked? With what linguistic and semiotic resources might it be possible to speak and be heard? Many of you in this room have been working as teachers and researchers for decades, opening up spaces for youth to be authors and performers of meanings about their lives. And I thank all of you for this work across the US and internationally, where improvisations with local materials, time, and space inspire youth voices and belonging. I'm going to tell two stories of kids telling stories. And the first one is about Eid and Halloween. This story began in January 2009 when I created a deliberate space for listening to middle school youth so they could tell stories while they ate lunch in the school library. We called our storytelling group Story Club, which was part of a three-year ethnography of literary reading and storytelling among immigrant and non-immigrant youth. These are the kids, some of them. Chris, Habiba, and Sarah, and Tucker were regular attenders of Story Club. Lee and Akila attended a few times each. Habiba, Sarah, and Akila identified as Muslim with different histories of migration and training in Islamic faith practices. All of the girls knew several languages, including Somali and some Arabic, and arrived in the US at about age six. Lee and Paul, who is, Paul is not pictured, are white and Appalachian, and Chris identified primarily as African American with family relations who were white and Puerto Rican. All of these boys knew English only. Tucker, however, identified as Cambodian American and spoke Khmer at home. He liked to call himself American born Cambodian after reading the book American born Chinese many times over. Tomas, who is not pictured here, but will be in the next image, was born in the US and is Mexican transnational, traveling to Mexico several times a year. His dominant home language is Spanish, and like all of the kids in the story club, they readily engaged in English dominant conversations, but often used their heritage languages to clarify and to express um, specific ideas. The school where we met is located in a Midwest urban community where white Appalachian and African American residents historically settled and worked in light industry and manufacturing, but who are now employed in part-time low-wage food service, hotel, and cleaning jobs. The region is also a refugee resettlement area in the Midwest, first for Cambodian families, and more recently Somali and Somali Bantu as well as a new home for Mexican, Central American, and Dominican adults and children. During the first year of Story Club, we met in the library because this was the only space and time for immigrant and non-immigrant youth to meet and talk about their everyday lives. This is in their sixth grade year. Their language arts classes were divided based on children's English language proficiency. They were partitioned. So they were always in separate rooms rather than reading and discussing stories together. This fact actually baffled the English dominant kids, one of whom asked if the ESL room was the place where you could go to learn lots of languages. <laughs> As a teacher researcher, I worked with the graduate students to mediate the space between the kids, their teachers, and the curriculum so we could bring this group of kids together and begin to figure out what stories they knew from their histories and what stories they might want to tell together. 
Eventually, Story Club itself became a mediating space among youth as we gathered untold stories and documented how they imagined and interpreted one another's stories and their emerging shared world. During our first meeting, youth not first meetings, youth not only introduced stories about their lives, they also moved toward and questioned unfamiliar images, language, and everyday experiences. In February, as the kids finished their lunches, Chris asked Habiba about Halloween, and they all began to figure out the connections between Halloween and Eid al-Fitr, and the particulars of tricking adults into giving kids candies and other treats. So here we go. Chris says to Habiba, where was your first Halloween? Was it here? Habiba says, yeah, here. Chris says, in America? Or do they celebrate Halloween at? And Chris is trying to figure out where Eid is. She's here, but where's Eid? I have something else, Sarah says. Chris says, what's it called? Sarah says, Eid. Habiba says, Eid, Habiba says, Eid or Ramadan. Sarah says, some people tell it and they say, happy Eid, and they give you money. Chris says, oh, I want to go over there. <laughs> and I say, you'll have to learn that phrase. And Tomas says, happy Eid. And Chris says, happy, happy what? And Habiba says, happy Eid. But it's got to be in Arabic, says Sarah. And Chris says, Eid, Eid. And I say, how do you say it in Arabic? And Tomas says, oh, I know where to go. I know somewhere. And Sarah says, Eid Mubarak. And Habiba says, that's the way you say it in, in Somali, too, the same. And Tomas says, wait, the same day as Halloween? And Sarah says, no. And Chris goes, oh, man. <laughs> Chris says, what day is it on? And Sarah says, we, we have Eid each year. So it's a lunar-determined holiday, and it's going to change every year, right? Tomas says, what day, what day, which days? And Sarah says, I have no idea. Chris says, uh, do they give you American money? Sarah says, <laughs> and Habiba says, yeah, and Sarah says, no. And then Chris says, one of y'all said, yeah, and one of y'all said, no. And then Chris says, how much do they give you? Like $100, $2, 50 cents? And Habiba says, sometimes I get $5. And Sarah, she's good at one upman. <laughs> One time on Eid, I made 100 bucks just from one family. And Chris says, oh, yeah, I got to go there. <laughs> just from one family? And Sarah says, some people who are cheap and everything, they just give you candy. <laughs> and then Tomas says, I know where to go. There's this gas station where this Ar Ar Arabic, Arabic, my uncle has Arabic friends who work at this gas station. I can go over there and say and tell them Eid. Sarah says, if they talk to you in Arabic, what's she going to do? <laughs> and Chris says, pee myself. And Tomas says, I'll bring you along. I celebrate this hopeful moment among children who invented a story featuring themselves as actors in a globalized neighborhood, released temporarily, from anti-immigrant media hype and mundane worksheets, they could cross into one another's worlds and imagine one another's cultural knowledge as assets in a shared possible future. As Paulo Freire described in a 1985 interview, they came to this event full of spontaneity with their feelings, with their questions, with their creativity, with their risk to create, getting their own words into their own hands in order to do beautiful things with them to get words into their own hands, to own and act on their own world. These ideas have long been central to critical literacy education. Their beautiful words were co-developed through small stories, a kind of story that is not monologic, not single-voiced, and not very long, but shaped through a trajectory of interactions. In other words, they built the story and their relationships with one another as they went along reworking images from the past and creating a new imagined place for their future. Not over there, but here and local.
This kind of storytelling described by Oaks and Caps as co-narration allows for problem solving, questioning, much like the talk among friends or relatives with all the power dynamics and side eye that goes along with talking about everyday life. Through co-narration, participants navigate the codes, rules, and norms of what is valued and heard, as they also use gaps in meaning to co-create images and possibilities for one another's locations in these stories. Co-narration, like play, invites tellers to set the everyday into the background so that a possible, deliberately constructed world can come into view. Play is a crucial part of critical learning and literacy. Through play and stories, we learn that what appears to be literal and static is open to change. As Vygotsky writes, we learn to see otherwise through a creative reworking of impressions that contribute to a new reality. In the case of our Eid and Halloween story, the story club members use the questions and answers from their holidays to displace the status quo image of separate, different, and unequal worlds with a hy hypothetical street scene in which they were co-actors putting their intercultural capital to work. Being co-actors and telling stories points to another mechanism in the practice of ma imagination. Kids' improvisations and unpredictable storytellings may open up gaps for new ways of being seen and heard as a person among others. In this case, story club, club members' identities as students in a middle school library were momentarily displaced as they became global peers, reshaping the world at street level. This is what we believe literature does. A story disrupts the everyday and releases us from the here and now so we may experience being otherwise, entering into a new storyline as a social actor who can participate temporarily in a possible world, then return from that experience even as it is unfolding and reflect on who we are, who we might be, and who we might become. But what if a story has to be brought to light, made visible in the first place? How can a new story be heard? The stu new story took place four months after the Eid and Halloween event. Sarah, Habiba, and Chris, and three other youth, Akila, Lee, and Tucker, told a series of stories associated with the girls' deep cultural beliefs. Their stories were about jinnies, or spirits in the Muslim tradition, a spirit whose meaning and form were described and questioned over the course of 35 minutes. These are stories that would not be found in the curriculum or on bookshelves, and yet occupied a central part of the girls' storytelling knowledge and experience. I want to show how the stories were heard, and how being heard depended on the ways gaps in imagination were opened and sustained through linguistic and semiotic resources and intercultural imagination. As this session began, Habiba, Akila, and Sarah and I were the first to sit down, and Habiba started talking about a horror movie with a killer cell phone. If you answer the call, you die, which could be a way that um, uh, theaters could address the problem of cell phones ringing. <laughs> This movie reference led to the three girls discussing, primarily in Somali, a related event in which a girl they knew was overwhelmed by a jinni who entered her through a cell phone. Akila turned to me to say, you know jinnies, they're like ghosts, not ghosts, said Habiba, like masks, and she did this move, like masks. You know, shaitan, an Arabic word for an evil jinni. As the boys entered and began eating their lunches, Akila made a bid to tell a story from her life a bid that was immediately interrupted by me and then quickly picked up again by her friends. Akila says to me, my dad catch one, my dad catch one of them. And I ask, how do you catch one? As Akila begins to explain, Sarah joins in. You have to read it out of a person's body, but dance around them and then, and then they get dizzy and they do stuff and I can't say. It's so loud and confusing, you might as Akila explains directly to me, yeah, you gotta, you gotta read a Quran. You know Quran? You gotta read that. And then you will catch them. And then you will, Chris who's across the table asks, you will catch what? And now I explain, this is the same Chris. 
I explain vaguely, catch them. But Akilah, Sarah, and Habiba clarify, it's a ghost, actually. They dance at your house. It's not really dancing. It's kind of dancing. It's a march. <laughs> They're all kind of piling on in this explanation. Meanwhile, Lee is dancing in his seat. So they're off to a running start. But Akilah's story of her dad catching a ginny requires a frame of reference. Some of us at the table had heard small stories about ginnies from Sarah and Habiba, but they were usually interrupted with a story told about a horror movie. In this session, however, the girls persist and co-narrate the meaning of ginnies, even though the girls are by no means in agreement about the specific form or meaning of ginnies in their lives. In addition, these events, like any supernatural encounter, are difficult to verify. So the girls took a risk in making cultural beliefs and practices visible in front of the boys and me. They could be seen as unreliable or even unacceptable narrators outside of a familiar context of family and friends where the girls' references would be understood and elaborated. In Story Club, when Akila says, my dad catch one, the boys and I don't know what one really means or what catching means. And when Sara follows with, you have to read it out of a person's body, the words you and read and it are as disorienting for us as the experience of watching this ritual seemed to be for her. The girls opened up a space, a gap, a gap for seeing otherwise. But it was difficult for us as non-Muslims to see or fill the gap in understanding. The practices of co-narration, however, lend themselves to interruptions and questions, while they also call on the girls to use all available linguistic and semiotic resources to be heard. And so the girls backtrack to explain what it means to read it out of a person's body. In narrative theory, this move is called narrative backgrounding. Yay, a term that makes sense. <laughs> Through narrative backgrounding, te tellers provide critical information related to the deeper worldviews that inform and frame a story. In this way, a teller mediates and transports culturally historically shaped meaning across contexts, thus contributing to the potential for cultural continuity in new contexts. This bit that I've just talked about is exactly what we're going to find ourselves doing in the coming months and years as we try to explain ourselves to others. This slowed down, working through narrative backgrounding. In this event, the narrative background Akila, Sara, and Habiba co-construct actually provides the basic structure of a Jinni story. The Jinnis overtake a person's body, usually a child, an adult or spiritual figure intervenes by reading a sacred text, and the victim is healed by the words and actions of their community. Next, the girls confirm the reality of Ginny's as Akilah tries again to tell her so story. I saw one in real life. Habiba and Sarah add, I think everybody saw it. I saw it. Then Chris realizes he is not seeing in their world. I haven't. And Habiba explains the problem about, about the lines between them. Because you didn't live here with us. Chris is not invited to cross into their world as if he knows what they know but Chris could continue to listen and try to see otherwise. The gap in time and space created through co-narration includes a negotiation of power to define the boundaries between their worlds and the limits of speaking. Co-narration also creates a space for multiple voices often overlapping as in classrooms where stories are often lost. Here, Akilah persists with her story trying to, unfold, trying to hold the floor with multiple voices in an effort to describe her experience but she's not able to fully hold the attention of her peers. Despite her use of multiple linguistic and semiotic resources, she needs more. The girls then draw on one another's Ginny stories. These follow-up stories are called second stories in narrative theory. Here the girls explain the role of, of grown-ups in stopping Ginny's. They couldn't get into a grown-up because grown-up, they know how, what to do with them. Right. If you're with a grown-up, they cannot get inside you because they, they know. And then Sarah tells a small story, a second story, that actually challenges the claim that Ginny's don't get into grown-ups, but supports the evidence that Ginny's exist. It once happened, 
It did, a lot. That's how my grandma died. It happened to my cousin. He was small and my grandma was him. My grandpa was him, was with him, and it just came through both of them. In the gaps between the past, the present, and future that open up through storytelling, second stories and narrative background contri contribute to the moment to moment reworking of cultural material. Within these interactions, the codes and rules of everyday relations sometimes recede into the background so that a new way of being understood by others, of being otherwise, becomes possible. Listening to the girls' stories, Chris confers high praise by declaring, you guys are just full of stories. I know, for real, says Akila. A lot, we got a lot. Because people, Sarah starts, we could tell stories like for 24 hours, says Habiba, about people, about wars. Really? Yeah, we could tell stories about wars, says Akila. And they could, but those stories will have to wait. Tucker noticed that the girls' stories were mostly about other people's experiences, suggesting he had not heard Akilah's state account as a story of her own experience. He asked, has there ever been a spirit taking over your bodies? Tucker's question might be heard as a challenge to the girls' beliefs and believability, but the girls take up the question in terms of their unique connections with Jimmy's. Sarah shakes her head no. Habiba says, no, but it happened to my cousins. And now Akilah uses Tucker's question to finally tell her story. Yeah, I had my brother with me, and I was like, I was crazy. I was like, ah, get away, get away. And then they take me home, and my eyes were red, and I got sick, and then they take me home, and they read the Quran, and they heal me. As Akilah finishes, Chris waves his arm over his head to get the, the floor. He says, ah. Uh, can I ask a question? Do you all really believe that? His question addresses the girl's deep cultural experience in a tone of genuine curiosity and with a tentative acceptance of trust built over a dozen storytelling sessions. Sarah looks down and across at Akila and Habiba as she continues to watch Chris's face. But Akila and Habiba respond emphatically yeah, of course we do. We believe it very well. Then Habiba opens a gap for seeing and being otherwise. She projects the boys out of the presence, into her past, and toward a possible shared future. If you go to Africa and sleep there tonight, you will see them. I swear you will. You're going to freak out. <laughs> she invites them to cross into her world, under a dark night sky, in a Kenyan refugee camp. And then Akila co-narrates this shared past and imagined future, waving her hand at the library's fluorescent lights overhead. She describes their possible future. They will drive you crazy because Africa has no lights, not like the library. At night when you sleep, Africa is dark, and they like, they like the dark. Then the boys ask a lot of questions about how dark is dark, and whether Ginny's can blow out candles. Through the work of imagination in a gap between the present, past, and future, across the space between the Midwest and East Africa, Akila and Habiba invite us to switch off the library's fluorescent lights and see otherwise, and become otherwise. Global peers freaking out under a midnight sky. As the Ginny stories seemed to end, Chris, to my surprise, began a second story by first locating himself relative to those he had just heard. I believe in the stuff, what you just said, but I don't believe in curses because, like, my family is religious and I'm, and I'm Indian, and we got to go up to Washington for a powwow. And before we can, like, get on our reservation or something, the shaman, the shaman has to come out and like bless them, the people that don't live on the reservation. Then Lee and Tucker told stories in turn from their lives involving nightmarish events that afflicted their bodies and potentially their souls. In both stories, harm was averted by faith and adult intervention. 
Across 30 minutes, they told nine small stories about Ginny. And then these last three stories, all of which followed the same structure as the, Ginny, the original Gin stories. Ginny's were no longer the pretext for horror stories, but rather the site for intersecting experiences of being vulnerable, trusting in faith, adults, and ritual, and being cleansed. Think of the work they are doing and the resources required to bring the past and the future into the present. We had a space in the library and about 40 minutes to tell stories and eat lunch. And we had Akilah's compelling opening bid in front of us. My dad, catch one. Akilah wanted to tell her story. And so she mobilized multiple semiotic resources, including narrative backgrounds and second stories co-narrated co with her friends. The boys and I wanted to understand what Jin is meant to the girls, while the girls were interested in figuring out how they experienced and understood Jin's in similar and different ways. As the co-narration evolved, Chris and Tucker asked questions that centered the girls' beliefs in the present. Has this happened to you? Do you really believe that? And then the three boys turned those questions on themselves through their own storytelling from their past experiences. In both story events, as the kids' stories developed, they invited one, an one another to become social actors in one another's worlds while retaining the power to establish boundaries for belonging. The imagined scenes of being transported to another space, I'll bring you along, and if you sleep in Africa, you're gonna freak out, were preceded by conditions. What you gonna do? And you don't live here with us. This kind of work with Story Club has continued with groups facilitated by amazing OSU doctoral students, Rebecca Bruce, Beth Crone, Francisco Torres, who's now departed to University of Colorado <laughs> in Boulder, um, and Samantha Stewart, who has been working on storytelling with preschool age children. We're reading superhero stories with sixth and seventh graders who are adapting these images and storylines for their streets and the concerns they have for equity and justice. We're talking about black female athletes and their representations in books and in the school's phys ed program. We're looking at stories of migration and how these are heard and not heard in school. We are working to keep open the gaps in time and space for imagining and for speaking and being heard. We are holding on to radical hope. And now I, I want to turn our own LRA moment in the present, I want to turn to our own LRA moment in the present based on a profound labor by colleagues across decades, across a coalition of LRA groups who've been engaged in defining a future based in our commitments and knowledge to engage equity and anti-oppressive and anti-racist action in our research, teaching, and our organization. In collaboration with the executive committee, I invited eight people, or all of you, <laughs> go listserv, <laughs> to read the role of literacy research in racism and racial violence. This statement has a long history of authorship and collaboration. The statement of history will be posted when the final draft is completed. And I want to thank Marcel Haddix for her leadership throughout this effort and for drafting the history. The statement was reviewed many times by many different groups and was endorsed by the Board of Directors on Tuesday, November 29th, 2016. As far as we know, this is the first endorsement ever for LRA. We celebrated that vote during our meeting with a shared reading of the statement. And now in the midst of a long and painful year, we want to share that same sense of being centered and grateful with all of you. You'll see the statement on the slides. Please stand and read along with the readers as you feel so led. Kathy and everyone, could you come up?
the mission statement of the Literacy Research Association states that the Literacy Research Association is a community of scholars dedicated to promoting research that enriches the knowledge, understanding, and development of lifespan literacies in a multicultural and multilingual world. LRA is committed to ethical research that is rigorous, methodologically diverse, and socially responsible. LRA is dedicated to disseminating such research broadly so as to promote generative theories, inform practices, and sound policies. Central to the LRA mission is support and mentoring of future generations of literacy scholars. According to this mission, the Literacy Research Association is concerned with, the, with research that impacts policy for individuals from racially marginalized communities, People of color in the United States constitute a large number of these individuals whose experiences have become increasingly oppressed, life-threatening, and illegitimized. Issues of racism are not peripheral to literacy research, and literacy research need not remain peripheral to issues of racism. The Literacy Research Association resolves that we will not ignore issues of racism and become complicit in the perpetuation of racial inequities, neither in the field nor in the organization itself. Children and youth in our schools today are living in a time of heightened racial violence. And these are the contexts in which literacy research examines issues that affect literacy learning and achievement. Historically, literacy research has played a role in promoting and sustaining, as well as interrupting, deficit-centered narratives about the literacy practices of people of color. LRA stands poised to address issues of oppression against black and brown youth that begin within classrooms where certain ways of doing language and literacy aligned with and representative of white middle class norms invalidate the literacy practices of black and brown youth in schools. The role of literacy research in perpetuating or interrupting deficit oriented narratives about the literacy practices of people of color is powerfully influenced by the racially oriented challenges faced by scholars of color, both in their home academic institutions and within professional organizations, including LRA. In order to build our capacity to address racial inequality in schooling and literacy research, LRA leadership and members have begun to confront our own racialized history and colonizing practices that permeate LRA and that determine who is included and excluded within the research community. LRA acknowledges that racialization and not only race and liquidism and not only language are pervasive in the 21st century. These continue to confront scholars of color and remain a challenge for black and brown youth who, like these scholars, have experiences that are discounted by the mainstream. Within LRA, pockets of progress have emerged and continued advancements are necessary to fulfill the responsibilities of the organization according to our mission statement. We will raise the visibility of anti-racist scholarship particularly research that might shape more equitable educational practices for children and youth of color. We will critically examine our history as an organization and field to understand and to respond to racist practices. We will raise our voice Excuse me. <laughs> we will raise our efforts to make visible and address the racism faced by scholars of color within the organization, in their academic institutions, and in their everyday lives. We will critically examine our decisions, leadership appointments, and governing documents. 
And now together, we stand united as officers, board of directors, and members of the Literacy Research Association to take a public stance against racism and in support of equitable, inclusive, anti-racist educational practices and spaces. Thank you.